something happened on May the 22nd, 1973, something that launched a revolution in human communications. One location, three events, all celebrating a dynamic, ongoing culture of technical innovation. And you are invited to join the movers and shakers of the networking world at Silicon Valley's famous Computer History Museum. A conference organized by Park, CIOs and business leaders. A fabulous chance to meet Ethernet inventors Bob Metcalf and Dave Boggs and other networking visionaries, pioneers and drivers. Yeah, how today's innovations impact tomorrow's business. A gala dinner with charity auction, Ethernet innovation awards and a host of sponsorship opportunities in aid of the STEM project. Gala ticket holders will rub shoulders with the industry's key movers and shakers, including researchers, business leaders, visionaries and top Silicon Valley VCs. Then a NetEvents Global Press and Analyst Summit for invited business leaders. Over 50 IT press and analysts from over 35 countries enjoy private briefings with the industry's top networking and telecoms organizations, plus countless sponsorship and high-profile speaker opportunities. Just be there. Don't miss the biggest celebration in networking history. And now we're here. Welcome to the Ethernet Innovation Summit. My name is Manik Dubash, and I will be your host for the day. So, thank you for coming. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, let me say first of all, this event would not, we're here to celebrate Ethernet's 40th birthday, obviously, and uh, the event would not be possible, so it would be uh, without our key sponsors, so it's appropriate for me to mention uh, all these wonderful, uh, wonderful companies who've helped us put this event on. Uh, that's Net Events, who've organised the thing. But I'd like to pull out just a few people. Um, first of all, MEF President Nan Chen, whose idea this whole event was. This event is also being streamed live over the internet, so it's also appropriate for me to mention Comcast, who dug holes in the ground uh, within a couple of weeks and uh, put a 100 meg pipe in, a uh, fibre pipe in, so that we could all get a good, good Wi-Fi, courtesy of Cirrus, um, and uh, Tata Communications, who put in their, their CDN to stream the stuff out to the internet. From a conceptual point of view, Park, uh, Park CEO Steve Hoover has been a key, uh, a key uh, mover and shaker in, in helping this event happen. And of course, the Computer History Museum itself, a place uh, uh, who's, who's uh, 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 redolent with computer history, what can I say? A wonderful, a wonderful venue for this event. Amongst you in the audience, we have researchers, analysts, press, CEOs, inventors, VCs, all sorts of people, movers and shakers within, within the industry. And today we're going to be talking about Ethernet and networking in the whole. We're going to be talking about how Ethernet came about. We're going to be talking about how Ethernet works today. We're going to be talking about the future of Ethernet. This is, guess what, it's an Ethernet day. And uh, without further ado, I'd like to hand over to um, uh, Mr. Paul Sappho, who is going to uh, come up and talk a little... I'm sorry, Steve Hoover is going to come up first to... Uh, basically set the tone for the day, uh, and uh, then Paul's going to come and um, um, introduce the panels. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, it's, uh, good morning, everyone. It's my pleasure to welcome you all to this uh, Ethernet Innovation Settlement to celebrate the 40th birthday of the Ethernet. Uh, we're really thrilled to be one of the hosts uh, for this event with the Computer History Museum and, and, and with the MEF. And, um, you know, I remember when this came about uh, in a call with, uh, you know, some email exchanges, actually, I think initially with, uh, with, with Bob, as we were really reflecting on um, what it means to be associated with uh, such an amazing invention. You know, the creation of the Ethernet um, and associated technologies really are the fabric of our lives today. I mean, as I look in the room and I see the set of uh, computers we have and handheld devices, uh, uh, and how important the Ethernet was to the creation of this highly distributed network. Um, and really thought that it was a great chance not only to stop and reflect and honor the people who did that, and in the end, this all comes down to people who do these things. And so that's what we've assembled for you here today, a set of folks to, to really help you understand what occurred. But we thought it was a great learning opportunity also to try to understand what is it that we can learn from 
uh, that that's applicable today. So we've got a set of panels and conversations around those areas that we hope we'll, we'll, you'll find enlightening not only from a historical view and not only a, a chance to get to know the people um, uh, who uh, helped to create this, but again, what can we take from it today and apply to other contexts and apply to the evolution of uh, networking? So hopefully you'll find the day a productive one. And um, uh, with that, I would like to uh, welcome up uh, Paul Sotho as soon as he stops running the other way. <laughs> and uh, Paul's going to set the context uh, uh, for uh, where we were 40 years ago and how that led to the creation of the Ethernet. So thank you, Paul. Thanks, Steve. Good morning, everyone. This is so cool to be here. Um, uh, <clears throat> my name is Paul Savo. I teach at Stanford. I've been around the valley for, uh, God, a couple of decades. I'm a forecaster, and, and I finally caught entrepreneur's disease and started a company three years ago. But I'm here to set a little bit of context. So let's just, uh, you know, is there somebody in the room who understands wireless technologies? Uh, there we go. May 22nd, 1973. Let's just think about the context here. So Johnny Carson had just finished sponsoring or hosting the Emmys, and the big win of the year was Sanford and Son. Um, three, days, or three weeks earlier, Secretariat had won the first race in the Triple Crown. And three days earlier on Sunday, May 19th, uh, he had just won the Preakness. We we're all waiting to see what would happen on June 9th uh, in Belmont. Um, the day before, the Watergate committee heard testimony that there might be some tapes that would clear Nixon of any suspicion of involvement in the Watergate break-in. And in fact, on the same day, May 22nd, Nixon had a press conference and said that he would waive executive privilege and, and promise to get to the bottom of this terrible crime. Meanwhile, for the few people who actually knew anything about computers, oh, I also should mention May 22nd, uh, not the day, but that week, still sticks vividly in my mind. I was a freshman at Harvard at the time. <clears throat> as approaching finals, but that wasn't the issue. I actually, I don't know if it was on that Tuesday or not, was, was um, uh, approached by AT&T security. Um, <laughs> they discovered that I was a not fairly good blue boxer. And so there was some question about whether I was gonna come back in my second year at Harvard or not. Luckily, I, I did, so I always think, but little did I know, you know, in that world, at that time, if you were very, very, very lucky, that's how you accessed computers, was on a silent 700, because otherwise you were stuck in, in a time-sharing center. And, and I remember working over the Christmas holiday just before then at the Science Center at Harvard, and they turned off the heat during vacation. I actually had to wear open-fingered gloves to stay warm while working at a time-sharing terminal. So we were very, very lucky to even have these things. But what's absolutely amazing about that moment in time is that the way we talked to computers was with this thing. Exactly the same way we talked to each other. You know, as you look at the top, the little suction things went in. And so the question that I think about back then, of course, I had no idea what was going on at Park. I didn't even know Park existed and the like, but what were these people thinking? I mean, what were they thinking to design this, this phenomenally high-speed system, you know, 2.94 megabits per second, when the rest of the world was just grateful to have one of these things plodding along? And, of course, that's what today is about, is what were they thinking? You know, what happened when Bob Metcalf wrote his famous memo on that day? So today is about... Of course, we're looking back at history, but the point of looking back is in order to look ahead. That events that happened 40 years ago are extremely relevant today because this is about innovation. This is about white space. This is about changing the world. And our computers have changed, and you know, 
I haven't even seen one of these things connected to a phone for about a decade. Um, but amidst all the changes, the constant is how do you change the world? How do you change the world for the better? How do you create innovation? So consider this as a day of looking into insights and how innovation happens. And in that regard, I just say a word about standards. You know, it's a funny thing that when an engineer or a team is trying to get something adopted, they're single-mindedly focused on saying, please, world, just say that you'll try this. And, and, and Bob Metcalf has famously said he got rich not off of Ethernet, but off of selling Ethernet. Um, and that's a key part of the innovation process. But what innovators often forget is actually the biggest consequences to a standard is after the standard is accepted, because standards have a funny way of staying around for a lot longer than we imagine. So just think about that email you wrote this morning and the standard stack that sits underneath it. It's, it's almost like digging into an, you know, an archeological site in the Middle East, you know, you go down through history that you've got ASCII and you've got HTML and everything. You go all the way down to the alphabet, which is probably the oldest standard in it, which probably dates back to a Babylonian farmer cooling his toes in an irrigation dish while you know, pressing images into clay. Ethernet is fascinating in this regard because it's exactly, it's not quite a standard, but in the sense it has pieces of standards to it, it's the right kind of standard, standard we have. Jaron Lanier once said, standards are like karma. You know, bad karma comes back to haunt you forever, and bad standards haunt you forever, things like VRML. Um, good standards, become a platform for further innovation. They evolve, they change, they expand uh, other opportunities for devices that nobody ever imagined would even exist. And so this is a story about innovation, it's a story about evolving standards, it's about something that happened 40 years ago that sent events running off in absolutely the right direction to create innovations that are still continuing today. That's why we're here. So I have the pleasure of introducing um, our prime suspect in all of this. Uh, Bob, where are you, Bob? Bob Metcalf, oh, he's good, okay. Uh, Bob is gonna come up, but I just wanna say a word or two about him. He's got two bachelor's degrees uh, from MIT, PhD in, in 73 from Harvard, and one important detail, his first run at the PhD, Harvard, the, uh, his committee turned him down. So he got his PhD tossed out, uh, which was very fortunate because then as he was working, he came out to Park uh, and uh, Bob Taylor said, oh, you know, forget that university on the East Coast. We don't care what degrees you have. Uh, come on out and when you get around to it, you can finish your degree. Turns out that's part of the innovation process. But just a few other things. He's um, has had an extraordinary career. He has more awards than one could shake a stick at. He uh, won um, the National Medal of Technology. He's the, had the IEEE Medal of Honor, the IEEE Alexander Graham Bell Medal, and the ACM Grace Hopper Award. As you'll see with our panelists to come, that we're going to introduce panelists with a single word. In the case of Bob, a single word will not do. So the words that I associate with Bob are engineer, innovator, entrepreneur, publisher, professor, and above all, tremendously innovative troublemaker. Bob, the stage is yours. Thank you, sir. Did you take the clicker with you? <laughs> so we've decided to put my view of 40 years into 20 minutes. Unfortunately, I've got 40 years worth of slides here, so they're gonna go by quickly. Um, the, uh, Here's, here's what I think we're doing today, and I'm basically just going to repeat what Paul said. Uh, we want to gather innovation 
lessons, and I've begun writing them down. I have four of them so far. We're going to uh, hopefully sing Ethernet's unsung heroes. And it's true, I've gotten much more credit for Ethernet than I deserve, and the other people who are a little annoyed about that are here in the audience today, and we hope to <laughs> bring them forward. Uh, and then we're going to have a party, and, uh, and then tomorrow we're going to catch up on the, what I believe is about a $100 billion industry that calls itself Ethernet. Uh, so depending on the meaning of the words I and invent and Ethernet, for, there are some values of those three variables for which I can say I invented Ethernet. And I'm going to, in the midst of this talk, since there's a lot of bogging down in what the word Ethernet means, I'm going to explain exactly what it was, a very small thing, that I and Dave Boggs and David Liddell and Tat Lamb and John Schock actually invented at Xerox Park, which is a, one of the many meanings of the word Ethernet. Of course, Ethernet is now a brand that has escaped that. So I hope to get to that. And there'll be a lot of technical detail during that portion of the talk. So here's the, the bigger context for its Ethernet's invention. Uh, this is the history going back to ARPANET all the way through today. I, I, as you can see, I wrote this by hand, and then I photographed it, and then I uploaded it into PowerPoint. And I went through those steps because when, when Ethernet was being invented, PowerPoint did not exist. Then we would photograph them with a 35 millimeter camera. Key events here, you see the ARPANET, Internet 1.0, you see the invention of Ethernet in 73, the LAN wars from 81 to about 84, uh, we'll talk a little bit about. Uh, fast Ethernet coming out in 95, 100, we call the 100 megabits per second, Howard, we call that fast, if you may remember. Uh, uh, and then what followed. So we're talking about a small part of a very long history. Uh-oh. You can't see that, but that's the cover of my PhD dissertation. And, but what's notice is the map of the Internet. Can you make that out at all? You see those dots? Those dots are not cities. Those dots are not buildings. Those dots are computers. That's how many computers there were on the internet in 1973. You can count them. I'm now a professor at the University of Texas in Austin, and I, I love to show them this because you'll notice the internet goes through Texas without actually stopping there. <laughs> And what we were involved in at Xerox Park was called distributed computing. That was the term. That was, for example, the course I taught at Stanford had that term in it, distributed computing. And basically, we were going from a box-centric view of the world in which there were lots of little terminals connected to a big box in the center to a net-centric world in which the network was in the center. I'm not sure when we first started calling the network the cloud. Of course, it's now the cloud is um, used everywhere, but the network was in the, the middle. That's the picture. What I wanted to point out in this picture that you just saw a moment ago, so on the right is the Texas Instruments Silent 700, which we all had one of at Xerox Park, and its modem uh, acoustically coupled ran at 300 bits per second, 30 characters per second. In the upper, in the middle, at the top is a box of 35 millimeter slides. That was the method we used for giving presentations, overheads and 35 millimeter slides. And you'll see right in front of me there is what's called a Rolodex. So, so people had Rolodex. I had a Rolodex from, uh, for a very long time. I still have it, by the way. It's about, they came really big after a while. Uh, and then there's a, you'll see there's a telephone there. Over here are some pads on the lower left, but those aren't iPads. Those are just regular pads. <laughs> so let me describe the innovation space in which that aforementioned group of people were operating. Try to recall, this is the space in which we were attempting our innovation. We were going to put personal computers in a building, the Xerox Alto. The notion of having a computer on the desk was at that time controversial. Having a building full of PCs was, that may be the first time it ever occurred. And our great fortune was to be given this problem that had not previously existed. 
what do you do with a building full of personal computers? So about hundreds of machines spread out over a kilometer, one per desk. They had to be small and cheap. Cheap meant the computer cost $30,000. And uh, we were going to be upgrading, going from the Silent 700 to the PC. And uh, we ended up going a factor, the networking ended up going up a factor of 10,000 in that one step. Second, the applications we had in mind. We were building a network, well, first of all, these PCs were replacing Silent 700, so they should do at least what the Silent 700 did. So we uh, needed to, so I wrote Telnet for the Alto. Telnet, you all know what Telnet is? So we needed Telnet on the Alto so we could go log into machines around the, the internet. Uh, and then we were building a laser printer called EARS, 500 dots per inch, page per second. You multiply eight and a half times 11 times 500 times 500 per second and you get about 20 megabits per second. And we wanted to keep the printer busy. So the network had to be a significant fraction of 20 megabits per second. Uh, and we also had this general notion, uh, which is associated with the overall effort of producing PCs, that if we built it, they would come. That is, we were not really good at listing what the applications were going to be for all this, but there was a build it and they would come mentality. And that has happened. So in the history of Ethernet, every time we've built it, they have come. And by they, I mean the new applications. Now, we also had some di digital technology to play with. And I, this I sort of put up defensively, because I'm frequently approached by young engineers who say, why did you do Ethernet that stupid way? And the answer is, we didn't have LSI. We had MSI, uh, Medium Scale Integrated Texas Instruments 7400 Series Semiconductors, in which, for example, you could get two flip-flops on a chip. So a lot of, uh, so we had FIFOs, uh, which we needed to get the data in and out of the computer. Those are pretty integrated. We, uh, David Boggs found a CRC chip uh, to check that whether the bits had been damaged in transmission. The MOS memory is what enabled the Alto, and that was a, a, a part called the 1103 from Intel that held, had a thousand bits on one chip, at a penny a bit, roughly, and that was a big enabling technology. And then we had this uh, micro-tasking uh, microprocessor, the Alto itself, to play with. And we wrote our, we wrote our programs and protocols in BCPL uh, and assembly language. So that was the enabling digital technology. And I put that up mainly as an excuse for some of the stupidities of the early Ethernet, because that's all we could do. We didn't have uh, uh, LSI. And then there was the wire. So that I had just finished putting uh, MIT, a part of MIT and Xerox on the internet with a cable about this thick called the IMP cable that went from the mini computer into the packet switch. The cable was this thick. And when I put it on my board, I had to bolt it because it was very heavy and could easily break and strain relieve it with cable ties and so on. And then the... Uh, so cabling was a problem, and all, uh, our building had a room, a rat's nest full of cables in it, which was a problem. So it was very much on our mind to solve the cabling problem. And then we found the Aloha Net, and I noticed Norm Abramson is here, the inventor of the Aloha Net. And we, uh, it had two radio channels, so I, I went on an expedition, a, a field trip. I spent a month in Oahu at the University of Hawaii studying the Aloha Network. I recommend that field trip. Uh, so we wanted to solve the rat's nest problem. We had a large number of cables that would be very long and they could end up being thick with big unreliable connectors. And, and the speed had to be faster than 300 bits per second, faster than the Aloha network, which was about 9,600 bits per second, faster than the ARPANET. The ARPANET, we were really only getting 15 kilobits per second in and out of our time sharing system. Uh, but we had this damn printer and it was running at 20 megabits per second, so that was driving the speed. So we decided to choose a medium that had one wire. We, we looked at zero, by the way. Aloha Network had zero wires. The trouble is the modems were as big as this podium, right, Norm? 
and we needed to put one on every desk, so that wasn't going to work for us. And plus, we needed to run at megabits per second, so I hope you don't mind. We switched back onto wires, but only one of them, which we call the ether. And then there was the sharing part. So imagine 256 computers spread around the building. Where would they, as the data is going back and forth, how would that be clocked? Tick, 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 data, data, data. Would there be one clock or would there be a distributed clock? And we decided we weren't going to have a big central clock. Uh, the network was going to be completely passive, which meant the clocking of the data had to be in the data. Uh, and then we needed to arrange for the the stations to take turns. They had this one wire, but they had to take turns using it. How were we going to do that? And then it had to do that efficiency with low latency and fairness. And it was in the context of that that I ran across a paper by Norm Abramson at the AFIPS conference proceedings at the Fall Joint Computer Conference in 1970. And it had math in it, this paper. And that was important, first because it was math that I could understand, but second of all, Harvard wanted my thesis to be more theoretical. So, and you had math in the paper, so I said, aha, theory. And, uh, and in that was the math of uh, randomized retransmissions, which I'll return to in a second. And then we needed reliability. We're going to have a big cable running through the building that everything was going to be connected to. Wouldn't it be terrible if somewhere in the building that cable got grounded or shorted or broken? So a lot of energy went into making the reliability of the connection there very uh, high. And a man named Tat Lam, who I haven't seen for 20 or 30 years, he engineered that. Uh, he, ha he kept telling us it had to be under four picofarads. And that's all I remember, four picofarads. And so he achieved that with the transceiver. And so the transceiver could be on, but it had to mostly be off, and it had to be safely off. Its default mode had to be off, letting go of the cable so the packets could, from other stations could zip by. Then in hardware, uh, Dave found the CRC chip, which was one of the last things to squeeze on the board. We also had a software, we had a software checksum because we weren't sure that the Alto was that reliable. So we wanted to be sure that the bits got all the way into memory uh, and not dropped by one of the MOS memories we were using. So we had a software checksum. And then there were the protocols. And this is key, because we realized that the Ethernet, this network, would exist in a hierarchy of protocols with seven layers. And then we came to rely on those layers, simplifying our design. So for example, the Ethernet had no acknowledgments in it. There were no acknowledgment packets. All, they were just packets. The higher level protocol would create the acknowledgments, so we didn't have to, which made Ethernet simpler. So now I'm coming to the exact thing that we invented. We came across a method of encoding called Manchester encoding, which had the feature that in each bit cell, you, the first half of the bit cell would be the bit, and the second half of the bit cell would be the complement of the bit, guaranteeing that in the middle of the bit cell, there was a transition from bit to bit bar. And that transition would be the clock. So the clock was encoded in the data, and it came in the middle of every bit cell. And another cool thing about this encoding was that the cable was either on or off. You see, you could drive the cable to one, uh, say, five volts. David, what was the voltage? Three and, a half. Three and a half, thanks. Three and a half volts, or you could ground it, or you could let it go. And so in the case of Manchester, there were only two um, states yanking it up to three and a half volts or letting it go. So half the time you, while you were transmitting, you were letting the cable go which had very important consequences. It gave us huge advantages over the Aloha network, because the Aloha network couldn't listen to what it was doing. It could only deduce what had happened after the fact, and this gave us uh, great advantages. So with Manchester encoding, we then go to the Aloha paper. So the idea was the stations were going to put packets on the ether, and if they got through, fine. If they didn't, they would retransmit like the Aloha network taught us. So I looked at Norm's math. And, and uh, two things about it were annoying, Norm, as you know after my complaining for 40 years. There's one, he assumed the network had an infinite number of users and that they kept on typing even if the packets got lost. And I knew that the Aloha network had six users, which is a lot less than infinity, 
and um, people would stop typing if the packets didn't get through. So in the, in the process of simulating this to see what the numbers really were, I wrote a computer simulation of the Aloha network. And there came this awkward moment in writing the code where I had to specify the mean of the retransmission interval. And Norm's math did not have any such thing in it. So that was the first departure, is I actually had to specify what the mean of the retransmission interval was. And then I started running the simulations, and I started noticing that every time I ran the simulation, even with all the parameters constant, I got a different answer each time, which meant that the state space of the channel was bimodal, the right-hand diagram. That is, Norm's math did, dealt with the average, but as you can see, the average is very unlikely. It's in the middle of this big valley. Uh, so then we applied Manchester, and this is it. This is the thing. This is the invention right here. Manchester encoding to make that channel stable. And we did it like this. Because we had Manchester encoding, every time a packet was going by on the network, you could tell within a bit time by just listening. Just listen to the cable and you could hear the Manchester. And if there was somebody already transmitting, that was not a good time to start. So we could avoid collisions by just listening first. And that was called carrier sense. And then because the network was off half the time when you were sending, while you were sending your own packet, you could be examining whether anyone else was sending in the half, half bit cells of each bit. You could listen and tell if there was a collision. So we had collision detection, and the radios of Aloha Network couldn't do that. And then our packets were up, uh, uh, weren't just uh, card images, 80-column card images. They could be really big packets. So the ratio of the packet length to this collision uh, avoidance mechanism is very large. So we could amortize one collision interval over a very long packet. So we were therefore able to get um, high efficiencies. And then one more thing. How do you get the ch uh, channel stable? And what we discovered is if you, discover, if you hit too much traffic, the proper instinct was not to try harder. You send a packet and it gets collided. You don't try harder. What do you do? You back off. You, you try less hard. You back off. And so back off. So do you all see, this was the invention, that, that group that I mentioned before. That's what we came up with, using Manchester encoding with the constraints that I enumerated prior. And um, this is where the Aloha network came in, taught us how to do randomized retransmission. And what we added was the, the fact that we were on a cable and this back off thing. So that led to this memo written uh, uh, on May 22nd. And uh, I like showing this because it's, I really like annoying the people who invented Wi-Fi because there's four or five of them arguing about who invented it, and I've met them, uh, all of them, and they're always kvetching about who invented it, sort of like the Ethernet people who invented Ethernet. Web. And I've explained exactly what we invented. We didn't invent everything else. So what I do is I generally claim to have invented Wi-Fi, too. <laughs> and, and you see on this diagram on the far right-hand side, what does that say over there? Radio ether. Well, what do you think that is? Well, it's either Aloha Network, which is probably what I had in mind, or it's a, a very long-term anticipation of the arrival of Wi-Fi, and therefore I, I invented it, for those of you who are... Um, so this is where we decided to call it the ether. We chose thick coaxial cable because it could be tapped passively but we anticipated other media would be used, so we didn't call it coax net. We called it ethernet because the ether could be coax, twisted pair, radio, optical fibers, a power line, whatever you wanted. And that was a diagram uh, in 1976 of what we built. That big yellow thing is the cable. The official color of ethernet is yellow. And uh, of course, this bears no resemblance to the ethernets that you're using today, in which that big yellow cable has been collapsed to a box, and the rat's nest has been recreated. So that's the original uh, transceiver by Tat Lam, the Gerald cable tap suggested by David Liddell, 
this uh, thick coax. Was it 50 or 75 ohms, David? 75 ohms, and then we went to 50 ohms later? It's a very important technical fact there, the ohms of the cable. It's also a half inch thick, uh, which was uh, later a problem. I saw this, this exists yesterday. This is the uh, Ethernet at Xerox Park, uh, at Park, uh, in which it was near where the EARS printer was. And uh, this is Dave Boggs on the left and Ron Kern. So Dave Boggs and I invented, uh, with the other people I mentioned, uh, did the work of building the first Ethernet. Ron Crane there in the back, he's the one who picked it up at Xerox later and joined me at 3Com Corporation to make it an IEEE standard. And then followed uh, the LAN wars, and these are some of the, the weapons of the LAN wars. Promotion, which is standards are a good thing. Join, uh, get on the Ethernet bus. I'm plugging Ethernet, etc. That lasted two or three years. And then two things happened that helped. One was the arrival of the IBM PC in uh, August of 81. Finally, a PC worthy of Ethernet. That is, the 8-bit Apple II was, uh, the Ethernet was gross overkill for an Apple II, but it uh, worked for the IBM PC. And then the other breakthrough happened in the late 80s was the uh, switch from coax to twisted pair. We were fighting in the market with the IBM token ring, which used twisted pair. And the customers kind of liked that, so Ethernet decided to become Twisted Pair 2, and that sealed the doom of the token ring. <laughs> so now where is Ethernet going? Have I run out of time yet? Keep going. So here's, Ethernet is not done yet. So here are the five directions in which, uh, probably others, but these are the five I thought of, each with its own preposition up into, over, across, and down. So Ethernet as a LAN continues up, and the, the IEEE has recently started a project to standardize 400 gigabit per second Ethernet on its way to terabit. Ethernet has also left the LAN and entered the WAN, where it is slowly wiping out Sonnet, which was the previous LAN, WAN infrastructure. That is, the, in the early days of the internet, we relied on the telephone company. Now we don't so much anymore. Uh, it's gone over the airwaves, hence Wi-Fi, across the telechasm. Thanks to the MEF, the Metropolitan Ethernet Forum, Ethernet has now become a service offering of the carriers going across the telechasm between the LAN and the WAN. And uh, Ethernet, under many names, uh, or, uh, is now going down. We're now going to network embedded microcontrollers about 10 billion of which are shipped every year, and most of them are not networked yet. And that's being taken care of now. So that's where Ethernet's still going. And then let me just close with the innovation, my view of the innovation horizon ahead. As you know, the internet, with Ethernet as its plumbing, has disrupted a series of industries, you know, like music, books, telecom, television, you name it, there's a bunch of them. Well, there's three more industries about to be disrupted, and they'll be disrupted by these new kinds of traffic. So down the left, you have the new kinds of traffic, video, mobile, and embedded. And then across the top, you have the three new industries to be disrupted. These industries are begging to be disrupted. They can't wait. Energy, healthcare, and education. And so what I find it useful to do is to look at each of the boxes there to see how will that traffic disrupt that industry, and it's in those boxes that we find the needs for ever faster, better Ethernet. So that is the end of my uh, remark. Oh, I, and with six seconds to spare. So, Paul, uh, you're going to come back up? So, that was um, a warm up for the day's facility uh, festivities.